colleagues, uh, my name is Maria Dovac Dusevili. I'm very, very happy and pleased to welcome you to uh, our last session with uh, Irene Dolte, our holistic life coach, who today will be talking about emotional defenses. It will not be this time the EFT session. It will be really dedicated to introduce you to, and to, to give you the overview of emotional mask that we are used to wear everywhere we, we, we go. We are different masks independently of our, of the situation, of the place. And sometimes you, you're saying, you know, this, this guy or this lady, she is completely different out of the office. When she is at home, she's so nice, but at the office, it's a completely different person. So this is why we ask Irene to, in, to explain and today to tell us why the people are wearing so different uh, masks. And she's going to tell you more than I know. Thank you very much for being with us. And now I give the floor to Irene and Alte. Thank you, Maria, and 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 also a, a bigger thank you to you because what I understood is that you have really been a leading voice and a leading change agent within the institution to bring many different actors, not just me, but you've and you've invited many different complementary health professionals. You know, which in this day and age, um, from what I've understood and from the echo you have received and shared with me, have really contributed to people's well-being. So a great thank you to you. Um, for creating this opening and these opportunities. So my name is Irina Nolte. Um, I'm a holistic health and life coach and Shiatsu practitioner. I started my career by studying international human rights law and international relations and worked uh, as an international human rights advocate. And very early on in my career, I had some kind of burnouty crisis um, that really propelled me into investigating other questions of emotional and physical health. And during that time, I came across Shiatsu, the, the Japanese art of acupressure that is based on traditional Chinese medicine. And I thought that it was a good idea to study that. So initially, I studied it as a hobby, you know, as it, how, as it goes. And then I was more and more convinced and, and impressed by the healing arts and just the whole world um, that, that opened through that to me. I then went on to study uh, systemic coaching in Berlin and, and, and holistic life coaching here in Belgium and, and, many, and EFT, of course, the emotional freedom technique. And I know or I assume that many of you who are here today came to one or the other EFT conference that I've given um, in, this, uh, in this setting. So today's conference, as Maria already mentioned, um, today's conference will be a little, or today's presentation will be a little bit different. So we're not going to be doing EFT. Um, today's presentation is really about different psychological masks that we all wear. And I've uh, prepared a pr uh, presentation for you. So let me just share my screen because then it's going to become all much more understandable. And I'm going to use this here. Okay, voila. So it's called understanding psychological profiles. Uh, we also can also call it defenses or, or masks. And um, the way I've constructed this talk is that I will, I will run through uh, the different masks that we are all wearing, right? So I will, and I'm going to be using the, the term defenses and masks interchangeably, right? Mask, defense, the persona that we project towards the outside. I will present these different defenses. I will give their different characteristics. I'm sure you're going to recognize yourself in one or the other. Um, I will then explain the intention that's behind them and the purpose they serve. All masks or defenses serve, if you want, one great, um, one great need, one great basic human need, which is to feel safe, right? So, Every one of us constructs this need for safety differently and we go about it through different needs. So I will go into the different defenses. There are five in total. I will explain them. I will show what the hidden needs are and what the hidden agenda is. And then I will use the different masks to give you further lifestyle and dietary advice. It's all going to make sense to you in a minute. So there will be a mask, it will be explained. 
And then you will get, yeah, as I said, dietary advice and lifestyle advice so that you can really nourish yourself and bring healing energy to yourself. I'm a firm believer that coaching and healing should be as practical as possible. I really want people to kind of leave my, my, my presentations and also my sessions knowing what they have to do, right? That you really have something tangible and that will be provided today in this presentation. Before I go into the masks, however, I just want to give you a holistic perspective of what I understand as health, right? Health is far more than the absence of illness. Michio Kushi is one of the founding fathers of the macrobiotic movement. Macrobiotics is one approach of health, and there are many. There's Ayurveda, there's homeopathy, there are the herbalists, the naturopaths, and so on. Macrobiotics is one approach to food and lifestyle and understanding life in general um, that I found uh, extremely useful. And he defines health um, as having abundant energy without fatigue. So I think that also implies that we have stable energy levels. Having, having a healthy appetite, enjoying deep and restful sleep, which of course is an issue for so many people these days that got more problematic through the lockdown. And by the way, I've just given a conference on that. If you have sleeping problems, I've just given a presentation on that and Renouveau Democracy will shortly put it online. Um, further signs of health is having excellent memory, using your anger constructively. So lots of people uh, in our society, we're not being taught how to use anger constructively. So we keep it inside. We, 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 and then we have these angry explosions or of course um, we can turn anger against ourselves. So health, health, a healthy approach to anger is by using it constructively. Being joyous and alert, feeling endless gratitude for life. And I added two points, which I think are really important, uh, namely being in touch with your own needs. Many people are not, you know, many people haven't defined what their needs are. And I think that's their own personal needs. So I think that's very important. And living a life of purpose, you know, really feeling that you're aligned with your purpose and, um, and that you pursue your purpose. So needless to say that we live in times of great upheaval and great stress and great pressure. And pressure is so multi-layered these days, it's not even funny anymore. Um, I think it's safe to say that absolutely every living system, every living system is in crisis. So if we look at the environmental, you know, the ecology, if we look at the school systems, the family systems, our immune systems are struggling. Um, the economy and so on and so forth, political systems. So, so many systems are in crisis, which means that it becomes all the more vital, really, I mean, I was going to say prevalent, but I do think it's vital that we all develop practices that can ground us, center us, and bring us back to ourselves, right? Life is challenging right now. You know, we live in really complicated times and I think it's fair to say that everyone is suffering on, on one level or the other, you know, so being honest to yourself and becoming very aware of what you actually need and how you can support yourself can really help your emotional and physical health. Okay, so <clears throat> here's a little graph um, on brainwave in intensity with regard to varying stress levels. And this is important in the context of masks because or the defenses, because the more stressed you become, the more defended you become, right? So let me just explain this. What you see here are five different uh, levels of brainwave intensity. The first one is delta. This is when you are in really deep sleep. Then you have theta, that's more light sleep. And then you have alpha. And for those who have a a physical mind, which I don't do, but that's 8 to 13 hertz or cycles per second. In any case, that's a really relaxed state. So this is when you feel, when, when you daydream, maybe you just take a pause from your work and you look out of the window and you breathe more deeply or perhaps during your holidays, you've been in such a state, you sit by the sea, you sit by the ocean or on the mountaintop and you just feel this profound sense of peace and safety. And that state is so important because in that state, we actually heal. In that state, we open to our own intuition, we recuperate and, um, and yeah, it's a deeply strengthening state. And ideally, we would come back to that state once a day or at least once a day. Um, 
that of course is if you like if you're in a super stressed period or or nearing a burnout that of course becomes problematic and this is why it's good to know about alpha then you have low beta which i'm assuming is the state you are in right now so that's 13 to 20 hertz or cycles per second which means you have focused attention you feel you feel safe but you're a little bit more alert than when you daydream um, you feel safe, you're learning, and you engage with calm, analytical thinking. And then comes the fifth state, which isn't bad in itself. In fact, oh God, uh, so, Maria, can you please mute everyone? I got to Maria, can you please mute everyone? I hear people talking. Oh, I mean that. Can, can people please mute themselves? Or oh, Maria, can you please mute people? Thank you. Okay. And so you have your fifth state, which is called high beta. And that's when we're afraid, right? That's when we're really stressed. Uh, and we go in this fight, flight or freeze mode, because of course, in our modern society, I mean, you can't exactly just run out of the office whenever you feel you need to, even though that would be the healthy thing to let to let go of the cortisol levels in your system, in your in your cells. So here we're in a highly alarmed state. Um, as said, so the adrenal glands are secreting cortisol, which in themselves, this in, in itself has an immune suppressing function, of course, because all the systems within, within yourself, the digestive system and so on is, are being shut down and repressed so that you can flee or so that you can attack. It's a state of high tension and there's nothing wrong with that state because as said, when we need it, we have to be able to react. And so it enables us to flee or to fight um, and to get away. The problem, however, is if we get stuck in there, right? If, we, if every day when you go to the office or every day when you come home, who knows, you have to be in this highly alarmed state. That becomes problematic for your immune system, for your whole system. And so the question is always, how do we get back to alpha, right? What can we do to get back to alpha? Also in this, in this high beta state, the more scared we are, the more threatened we feel, the stronger our defense or our mask becomes, right? So, um, so of course, the more relaxed you are, it's what Maria said in the beginning, you know, perhaps the person in, I don't know, in the office setting has one persona, uh, might be unpleasant, and then the person comes home and is a really pleasant person or vice versa, right? Maybe the person in the workplace is highly pleasant and, and, and when that person comes home is no longer a pleasant person. So, so all of these, these, these things uh, exist. So then of course the question is, how do we get back to alpha? And I hope that this presentation can answer this question for you. <clears throat> a word on complementary health. So when we see a symptom, it's complementary health practices are observational practices, which means that we observe people, we observe what's going on for the person. When there's a symptom, uh, we see it as a call for change. So any symptom or anything that's going on in the person requires a behavioral change on, on behalf of the patient or the client. So to give you an example, if someone has repeated migraine attacks in the workplace, one approach would be to just take a painkiller and suppress it from a complementary health perspective, what we would do is to look at the setting and see why this is coming up. Can something be changed maybe towards your colleagues, maybe towards your, your supervisors um, and, and, and just inquiring what is going on below the surface. Needless to say that there's endless diversity amongst all of us, right? So, what I'm presenting is just one approach. There's so many different approaches. I will be talking about traditional Chinese medicine and the five defenses, but there are so many different health approaches and you just need to find out what works best for you. Okay, so these defenses, let me move this so you can read it better. Okay, so it's a typology that was developed by Wilhelm Reich. Um, and he basically developed that from the so-called body oriented psych psychoanalysis. It's a little bit too long to explain now what that means. Very important is that none of these psychological defenses are bad or condemnable, right? All of these defenses are good and bring their great worth to the world. It's just that they get, they get in the way, right? They get in the way of what you really want, which is to be accepted and, and appreciated. I think everyone wants to be accepted and appreciated. They arose circumstantially uh, through upbringing, so it can be from the context of your family, from your school, socialization, so maybe 
whatever happened to you in your past contributed to the mask or the defense that you are currently wearing. So <clears throat> as said, they, are, they, they constitute an individual coping mechanism and they, their function really is to, to protect ourselves from rejection and the fear of not being appreciated for who we are. So they cover up very particular fears and needs. Um, we wear different masks. We can wear, some people don't. We can wear different masks in different life situations. So you, you might be wearing one mask in your professional setting um, towards the hierarchy as well and have a different mask towards your partner, perhaps even a different mask towards your children. So that can vary and it can vary as we progress through life. So we use them in situations in which we feel unsafe. Um, what I will be showing you is the full spectrum of the defense, of each defense. So of course there are much lesser degrees possible, right? So you can really take it in, in, in homeopathic doses, right? I will just show you the full spectrum so that you understand what I'm talking about. But of course, um, these defenses might also appear to lesser degrees. The question, of course, we all need to answer is who do we become under stress? Right? And the better you understand that question of who you become under stress and why you wear that mask, the easier it is for you to understand yourself, your colleagues and families, family and friends. Okay, so what are these five defenses? Maybe I can even take that away, yes. Okay, oops, sorry. What are the five defenses? So the first defense is called the exhausted giver. The second one is called the controller. The third one is the escapist. The fourth, the needy, or I'm so sorry, why is this happening? The fourth is the needy and or the oral defense, and the fifth is the rigid. And I will go into all of them now, one after the other. Okay, so the first mask, the exhausted giver, which was also, I mean, a different name given uh, was the masochist, right? So of course, take it with a pinch of salt. These are just energetic gestures and you might, you might recognize yourself in some of them. Okay, so exhausted givers have a tendency to give and give and give and they do and do and do. Um, they care for others and they place others first, right? So these are people who generally overwork and what they do, what exhaustive givers do, is that they, they work so much and they have the secret hope of being appreciated, seen, and also, of course, loved in the, in the, in the private realm. <clears throat> they have little sense of power, so they don't actually understand the power that they have and how the, the, what a gigantic contribution they make to their workplace um, or wherever they're invested in. Their mask, so this defense of the exhausted giver is built around a sense of shame or guilt. So exhausted givers generally feel guilty or feel some sense of shame around something. If you ask an exhausted giver to, to engage more with their needs, that's really challenging for them. And they will find many, many ways of trying to deflect um, this kind of conversation or these kind of suggestions. Um, this, so the sense of guilt or shame arises in any situation masochists or exhausted givers act from a place of self-need or desire to take care of themselves, right? So they try to stay under the radar, they do all this colossal work, um, but they keep themselves in, in the background and generally align with more powerful people. So, excuse me. So the beliefs that, <clears throat> that run this mask. In general, so exhausted givers are not thanked or recognized for their hard, hard work. They very often put themselves into situations or land in situations in which they just, yeah, I said, they overwork, they overgive, and very often the person they work for or with magically tends to this, be this person who doesn't re recognize their needs, uh, their needs or their achievements, their accomplishments. They continuously feel they have to give more. Uh, they can be endlessly driven. So, so this, can, this can go on for years, actually. They don't dare to ask to, to, ask to have their needs met. They work extra hours and have a tendency to give more than what is asked for. They sacrifice themselves and their sense of self. And secretly, they know it. Secretly, they know that they deserve more. 
but it's so difficult for them to, to, to ask for it, to manifest that. They're very afraid that should they pronounce it, should they come forward and, and pronounce their needs, that they will be rejected or um, yeah, denied, denied whatever they're asking for. And so in order to keep on facing that fear of rejection, they develop elaborate strategies to ask for just enough to get by. So, so below the surface of great availability and generosity, exhausted givers feel angry. So on some level, they know that they're being wronged and that life is, is depriving them of something that, that they should be getting. And yet they feel helpless to change these circumstances. Um, and they have a tendency to see the world between those who have power and those who don't. And they, 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 they they tend to align themselves into the group that feels that they, that they are powerless to change their circumstances. So how to change that? How to address that? Oh yeah, this is just to, to show that life could feel like, you know, the, the Greek saga of Sisyphus, where you're constantly pushing this big, great rock or boulder up the hill. And it's, the minute it's up there, it comes rolling down again. Okay, so possible associated symptoms. So this is where traditional Chinese medicine enters the picture. Um, I don't have the time to explain why or how, but in TCM, we associate symptoms, right? So if someone is super exhausted, there are good chances, for instance, that the person might have lower back pain, right? Or vice versa. If someone has lower back pain, we ask the person if they're very tired. So because these symptoms are always interlinked. Now, where there's exhaustion, there might be low back pain, there might be tinnitus, this incessant ringing in the ears. From a Chinese medicine perspective, we associate that to exhaustion um, and, and the strength of the kidneys. On the kidneys, you have the adrenal glands, right? The adrenal glands co uh, secrete cortisol and adrenaline. So if we keep on pushing ourselves, then, um, then of course, um, the, the, the kidneys might be a little bit strained. <coughs> Everything that I've just described also, of course, can, uh, can lead to burnout. Um, burnout in general is, can be summarized as too much energy going out without sufficient energy coming in. In my experience, people who have burnouts are highly devoted, talented and invested achievers. So these are people who give everything they have because they really care and they are, they are deeply committed to their cause, you know. But the problem, of course, is like people who burn out, they have this great idea, ideal of what they want to achieve, which then clashes radically with external factors, hierarchy, management, relocation, lack of clarity, you know, and so on and so on. No delegation, no support, no support, no recognition. So burnout is actually a very normal and natural and healthy response um, to the crisis that these people encounter. <clears throat> which of course can lead to distanciation and loneliness and so on. Yeah. So how to how do we heal that? How do we deal this first mask and this real uh, this very real need that is behind it? So the first thing is that exhausted givers really have to learn to take care of themselves, right? They really have to become to the awareness that they have needs which are non-negotiable. People who are facing burnout and people who are in this exhausted giver position, they will battle you if you suggest that to them, you know? They will say, yes, but you have no idea. My situation is particular and there is no way out. You know, there's no way I can change it. I see it every, I see it almost every single day in my practice. Burnout always goes in hand in hand with this narrative of, of this situation that is just impossible to change until it has to be changed because you have to heal, right? You have to recuperate your strength. So exhausted givers need to know, uh, they need to become aware of their own needs. They need to learn to articulate them. Even that can be scary to an exhausted giver. They need to learn to delegate and to ask for help. It's all about getting to know and experience and express your own boundaries. And very often this can be simple needs such as rest and time out, time alone, but of course also being in a work environment where you are being seen for who you really are and appreciated for who you really are. You need to heal your kidneys. This is again from a traditional Chinese medicine perspective and possibly also the liver. And I will tell you how. 
In terms of lifestyle recommendations, what heals this <clears throat> and heals burnout in general, right, is moments of silence, uh, really quality silence, you know, I don't know, tonight is the full moon, for instance, so just sit by the window and watch the moon and just enter this different um, relationship with time. When we're exhausted, when we're stressed, when we're burned out, we're, we're in fear time, right? There's always the next deadline to be met. There's always something to be achieved. There's always something to strive for. And the workload is incessant. It is about exiting this fear time and entering a more spacious awareness of time that is much more generous and healing. There's a need for rest. There's a need for hibernation. I say that also consciously as winter is approaching. So really, taking the time to being at home and relaxing and maybe watching you know romantic films that nourish your heart or read beautiful novels um, that 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 take you into a different energy it's about insight into your own inner world so you might want to journal you might want to talk with someone about it it's about investing in your inner world meditation so by that i don't necessarily mean sitting on this meditation stool. You can also walk in the park or walk in the forest or just sit by a lake. Um, and in general, just take time to introvert. And just, you know, just by receiving a few deep breaths and arriving in the present moment. With regards to food, uh, to diet. So here you, you absolutely need to eat warm meals, ideally three times a day. So in the morning you can have porridge or a warm vegetable soup, um, but you need to have this warming food to really come back fully to your strength. Practice or engage with long and slow cooking styles. So the little sandwich on the go or you know this takeaway and so on um, is not as healing as what you might need in that state. Uh, so ideally, if you can cook, if you enjoy cooking, otherwise, then that's not the right thing, right? But it's these really long and slow cooking styles and food that takes time to prepare. Have quality protein, so lots of fish, lots of beans, a little bit of meat. If you're not vegetarian, of course, that can also uh, be very strengthening. Now, I'm a huge believer in short grain brown rice. <laughs> so, so that's the rice you, you, you buy in the organic store. I mean, by the way, I think we, only should, we should only be eating organic food. It's good for the earth and it's just good for ourselves, for our immune systems. And the short grain brown rice is the rice um, that cooks for about 45 minutes. And it has a supremely calming effect on the nervous system. So I'm not talking about basmati rice or these other lighter rice, rice versions whole grain brown rice, uh, really try it out. If you're feeling anxious and exhausted, have rice for three days, you're going to see it's going to calm you down and center you. Sea vegetables, so hijiki, kombu, um, nori, and so on can be deeply healing because of all the minerals they bring to our body and they alkalize us. And have lots of root vegetables, seasonal root vegetables. So now we're entering autumn and winter, it's the season, so parsnips, carrots, leeks, and so on, everything that goes into the root, it really brings the energy down from a TCM perspective. Quality salt, so you have miso, shoyu, tamari, all these things that are uh, fermented, they are so healthy, they alkalize your blood, they alkalize your intestines, and the more alkaline you are, the stronger your immune system is, which in the current context, of course, we all need to pay attention to. And of course, reduce coffee stimulants and sugar. Okay. So then to the next defense, the controller. Um, I'm just going to, it's very abstract for me, you know, because I don't see anyone. And so I'm always, I, I sometimes always wonder if people are still there. Okay, there still seem to be some people. <laughs> it's the good news. Okay, so the controller, the second mask. And again, take it with a pinch of salt, right? It's not, I mean, th these can be extremes, but most people are, have, have very gentle tendencies of these. So controllers control others to feel safe. Um, they use their, their use power to make others conform to their view of things and to their needs and to their desires. They, they attempt to control others by limiting their freedom and taking away their choices. Uh, they keep others in boundaries to make themselves feel safe. They can be verbally abusive. They can be physically abusive. Maybe if you've encountered people like that, you know, extremely dominant, extremely, um, extremely unpleasant, this kind of person where you feel you don't have a right to express your own truth, right? And you're not even allowed to like share your arguments. 
because they just they just they just run over you like like um, don't know, like a bulldozer right so that's th these are controllers to the extreme we all need to be controllers yeah i really need to need, need to underline that in order to do our job we have to be a little bit controlling otherwise we couldn't be doing our job right so as said i'm showing the most extreme of the defense so that you can take elements of it controllers generally have a strong constitution they are very strongly built they easily rise to success and they have a very idealized image of themselves so one example we all know and it's a bit the cliche example but we can all um, i mean we all have an image is is trump right uh, um donald trump because he i would say really impersonates like the most extreme example of what i'm talking about okay so the controller as an employer uh, so controlling employers tend to control quite a bit right and this is because they're afraid they're afraid that their employees have no real commitment to the job they're afraid that if, if their employees are being given any freedom, that they're just going to abuse this freedom given to them. They're going to take time off, do poor work. They might even steal resources. Um, and so these kind of employers, but can also be colleagues, they closely, they, 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 they observe you with a suspicious eye and there's just no trust. There's just no trust in the other and this huge fear of betrayal. Um, that's actually controlling is the only way the controller can feel safe and capable of showing appreciation, right? But everyone is stressed. Everyone gets stressed by this behavior. So what are the main fears and beliefs of the controller? <clears throat> Controllers don't feel worthy of real loyalty or appreciation or in the private, um, in the private context of love, right? Controllers really don't think that they're love worthy <clears throat> in, yeah that they're love worthy in, in, in the private realm. They're super afraid of betrayal. Um, they do understand that their aggressive and controlling behavior might be offensive, but the fear of losing out on control on the other uh, is just too much to bear. So controllers typically are super afraid of leaving gaps um, in the program, in, 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 in meetings and so on. Everything is very tightly knit. Mm, controllers are secretly angry and even disappointed that they have to work so hard, right? So controllers work really hard. Don't, don't get me wrong. And again, there's something very good about controllers and everyone has to be a controller, right? In the, in the workplace, as I've said, but secretly they feel disappointed that they have to be in charge, that they constantly have to manage everyone, that they constantly have to arrange the world and so on in order to get some level of appreciation, if at all. They can be prone to outbursts of anger, even rage and frustration. So how do we heal this? How do we heal this defense? Controllers, that's really the most important point. They have to learn to listen, to truly listen. So the more controlling you are, the more there's a chance that you don't listen to the other, right? That 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 we just dump our truth, that we just dump our our vision of things on the other, and so the first step is really to to learn to listen. Other people have their own truth. Other people have their own vision of things, and it's really about practicing these listening skills. Perhaps even you know in, a, in actively practicing it um and um and yeah and just learn that other people have have their own vision of things and their own truth listening will help the controller to get to know their colleagues and and get to trust them and trusting them will help controllers to relax and everyone else to relax and there will be much more appreciation and and rest um and relaxation going on so give others the freedom to speak their truth um and oh yeah and that's also really important they must avoid a manipulation by all costs so controllers can be really manipulative to get what they want they can really push all the buttons to to have their agenda in place so um they have to become they need to become very aware of that that they're doing this and from a tcm perspective heal the liver and gallbladder so how do we do this when when we're very controlling in TCM, it can be a sign that our liver is a little bit congested, um, maybe full of toxins, too much pressure, 
too much too much junk food too many too many un unhealthy things unhealthy lifestyle not enough movement so it's always the chicken or egg question right is it the 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 um, the congested liver that's leading to these uh, to these kind of emotions or are the emotions influencing the liver and in tcm the two always go hand in hand so possible associated symptoms or emotions might be strong anger strong frustration um, these people can be highly irritable and have very uneven emotions and energy levels right so there can be great joy followed by intense anger by exhaustion and then there's an energy outbreak all of these things are signs that there's something with your liver going on and that your liver really needs a bit of detoxing and uh, and support um, as said so these people can be extremely dominating excessively competitive um, or it can it can implode and then there can be this lack of vision of where you're actually going in life a sense of depression further symptoms of the liver, uh, migraine, uh, the, the difficulty to fall asleep, and then arthritic conditions. That's all linked to the liver in TCM. All right, so how to, how to heal the liver, how to heal the controller. First of all, um, engage with creativity. So it can be anything, write your journal, go painting, go, I don't know what, whatever you like, um, maybe sailing, maybe, maybe hiking you know, any form of like expression of your inner freedom and space. Uh, engage with play if you can, you know, just some, some, some sports, um, something that gives you joy to really take you out of this intensive way of being. Um, practice non-competitive sports because given the controller is already quite competitive, uh, just something that is less competitive. Learn how to listen, I said that. So do a course in nonviolent communication. I think NVC is, is a beautiful approach to communication that can really help. Um, and, and even if you're not always aware of applying it, it can give you great insights into the way you have been communicating up to then. Bring compassion and understanding to your situation, right? So controllers generally work hard, they give a lot, they do a lot, and they're disappointed. There's a strong disappointment in controllers. They, they would like their world to be different, you know? So, um, so it's about fostering compassion for that and understanding and then bringing attention to your own needs. <clears throat> so how to heal that from a dietary perspective, limit animal food. Animal food can really lead to contraction and, and, and um, yeah, and can further really contract the liver. So limit it to the extent that you can. Limit also salt. Salt makes us very contracted and can really increase the intensity with which we meet the, the world, as well as baked flour products. So too much bread, you know, like all this stuff that makes you really like stuck and congested inside. Increase leafy green vegetables. So it can be anything from broccoli to parsley to, to anything, all green leaves that you find uh, in the store, because the chlorophyll really helps the liver relax and decongest and let go of toxins. You might want to try to eat less. Um, so, so just to come to a different sense of balance, you might want to increase salads, uh, just like a lighter di diet as well. Avoid coffee and definitely reduce alcohol. So very often with controllers, controllers work super hard during the day, come home, are exhausted. And given that they've been so driven and tense the whole day, a glass of wine, a glass of beer, if it's just one, that's okay. But you know, if it's on a daily basis and if alcohol is being instrumentalized, I do think that becomes dangerous, right? And alcohol, what does alcohol do? It relaxes us, right? So there's nothing wrong with alcohol. It's just the minute it, it has a function, I would start questioning it. Also, you might integrate more sour taste. So in the morning, have a glass of warm water with a little bit of vinegar, apple cider vinegar or lemon, um, and have lots and lots of soft and cooked steamed vegetables, right? Uh, so, so really bring that, that natural gentleness into your body and into your, into your being. All right. So we have three more masks to go. The next one is maybe the most mysterious one. It's the escapist, which was also called the schizoid. And by that, I do not mean schizophrenic, right? I just mean schizoid. So escapists or schizoids have a tendency to space out. Um, they, they, sometimes, they sometimes lose track of what's going on. They lose track of the situation. 
and it's almost like you can't really grasp them anymore even if they're sitting in the same room as you that they, they, they have somehow like lost focus and spaced out a little bit they can appear detached from reality and distant and disengaged um, and they have a tendency to to talk uh, in very theoretical terms so they, they they sometimes you just think like why why are we even talking about this and how did we get here and what are we actually talking about so it can become very very abstract and um, maybe a little bit intangible for you so what's the purpose of this why would why would someone engage with such a mask of, of course if there's a deeper purpose to it so Okay, so I'll get to that in a minute. The more schizoid you are, uh, the less in touch you are with the present moment. Um, schizoids also tend to be out of, out of touch of their own abilities and talents. They somehow float a little bit aside of themselves um, and they hold tremendous tension in their own body. So where is this coming from? Um, generally, schizoid had, not generally, why? A schizoid had a huge shock at some point in their lives, generally in, in childhood, right? So there was a big shock that happened to them, or perhaps even one of their parents was a little bit distant and schizoid, which is really challenging for children, right? Because children so much want to connect and so children so much want your help to ground them, right? They, they need your awareness for them to ground. And if a person, if the, if the parent is schizoid, if one of the parents is schizoid, then kids can sometimes follow in um, can follow in this kind of behavior because they're they're not receiving um, the embodiment of someone who's really incarnated and is able to be present for them. So that shock or that absence then resides within themselves. And given given that 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 the shock or or or, or, or these events that happen to them are full of full of emotion and full of tension and full of stress. We leave our body in order not to feel what needs to be felt, right? What needs to be felt. So escapists or schizoid feel hugely threatened uh, at owning and sharing their truth, right? So they, they would rather space out and not be there than to come back to what they're actually feeling. That's terrifying for schizoid. It's really scary for them. So they seek protection by not being there. Um, and yeah, the consciousness leaves the body uh, in order to escape this, ten this tense or stressful uh, circumstance, right? So what does it mean? It's, it's a self-protection mechanism, right? There are too many emotions, there's too much intensity, and they can't speak about their own truth, they can't talk about what's really going on within, within themselves, so they check out. Can be for minutes, can be for half an hour, um, yeah, can be for an instant. So how, how can these escapists uh, be helped? They have to learn to ground, right? They have to learn to ground. So you have to help them to feel safe. Uh, and how do you do that? When you notice what's going on, and maybe through this presentation now you will, you have to slow down the energy. So you need to talk more slowly, Maybe you can switch to a, safer, um, to a safer topic, right? Because if they space out from that subject, maybe you can switch topic, topics and talk about the weather or just make or just talk about the coffee break or something and just help them to come back and feel safe again in the moment and, and help them not feel threatened. On a personal level, of course, that is not in the work context, but um, escapists have to address this shock and this emptiness in their emotional heart, right? So something is going on there. So it's really about engaging with healing practices and therapy and so on that can help them talk therapy or touch therapy can be very good for them as well that can really help them access this place within they need to have find a place where they can express their anger uh, that they don't feel safe at expressing their truth and learn what they truly want and feel and need um, they very often feel like they have to be someone else someone false uh, and disconnect from, disconnected from their true self and so deep breathing practices uh, can help and all other practices, you know, it can be gardening, it can be cooking, it can be generally something where you use the hands is really, really healing uh, for escapists. Okay, further recommendations, sociability and community. So spending time with friends, spending time in a loving community of people can be a healing community as well. Um, carrying contact with others, so singing, laughing, expressing your heart, 
again meditation but for schizoids um, sitting meditation is too complicated so i would recommend something like qigong or tai chi um, or indeed guiding or whatever you know whatever you like outside because sitting meditation can be too and intense and so movement can really um, encourage a, a sense of safety and then you have something to do right so it's it's different anything that calms the mind and of course pets i think pets getting a dog getting a cat uh, getting a rabbit or whatever you want you know can really can really help you nourish the heart because the heart has to be nourished in this context <clears throat> um, in terms of diet uh, you have to stop sugar and alcohol if you if you recognize yourself in this sugar and alcohol alcohol of course is also sugar right from a tcm perspective has a very it has a relaxing effect but the energy goes up and out in us with sugar and alcohol and so the more you drink or the more sugar you you, you eat so that can be biscuits chocolate sweets you know you name it everything that contains sugar has this kind of very dispersing kind of energy. This is why we enjoy it, right? Because every one of us gets tense, every one of us gets stressed. And then of course this diluting energy um, that counteracts the contraction of stress and tension is pleasant. It's just, if you if you are a lot in this defense, you need to practice on, on, on arriving more in the here and now. Again, warm meals, again, whole grain rice, home cooked food to the extent that you can, because I think it has much more grounding energy than eating out and getting takeaway. Um, things like corn in the cup, polenta and amaranth are really good for the heart and bitter foods, anything that's bitter, Brussels sprouts, dandelion, chicory, and lots of berries. Berries also really, really heal the heart from a TCM perspective. Okie dokie. So then, we have the needy defense um, and that is also called the oral okay so orals or the, the the needy defense they have a tendency to ask the energy of others uh, so they ask the energy of you to help you they want to feel safe and nourished but they don't they don't want they don't see how they should do it themselves so they want this energy coming from you right so they want to be taken care of. Um, you will recognize them because they will seek your advice. You know, they can. There might be lots of complaint. There might be lots of lots of lamentation. Um, and then you give advice and you give it ideas of how they can of how they could change their circumstances. And they immediately reject that advice. They immediately reject these ideas. Um, and why do they do that? Because they don't really want to take control of their own lives. They want your energy. They want to be mothered by you. They want to be fathered by you. And so what happens if you're on the other side, right? If you're, if you're the one who's trying to like nourish and give advice and, and support, generally you end up feeling really drained after some moments. So you, you, you leave the meeting with such a person feeling exhausted and drained. That's how you recognize the needed offense. Um, yeah, it's just exhausting to spend longer time with them. And again, there's nothing wrong with being in the needy defense. I think we're all a little bit in the needy defense because we all secretly want to be taken care of if we're very honest. So, voila. Um, so what's the central feel, uh, fear of the oral or the needy defense? The orals or, or needy people fear that they will never truly be loved for who they are. They are afraid that their needs will never truly be met. And so they're in this constant state of neediness and asking you for support and asking you for this and that and that. And they hope that you will be the latest person who will provide a solution for their predicament, for their internal issues. They live in terror of abandonment. So abandonment is, feels really threatening to them. They're really, really afraid of it. They're really afraid of being alone, right? So being alone is very scary to them. And yet it is the thing that heals this defense. Um, they can have tremendous self-pity and tremendous rage in that self-pity. So there's real anger also that life is not giving them what they feel they are owed or should be receiving. They don't believe that they will ever be appreciated or loved in the way they are longing for. They project this need onto the other. Um, they can be full of accusation and and uh, and even attack, you know, because because they feel that you have to solve the problem for them. 
and there is a profound sense of self-rejection uh, up to the point of self-hatred to certain degrees. Further symptoms. Um, so there might be lots of worrying going on. There might be some weight gain. Um, very often there's constant eating or nibbling. There's a tendency towards having a sweet tooth. So especially around three, four in the afternoon, you know, just, I think, I think that's when most people, and I'm not saying this in any critical way, you know, most people have a down around three, four in the afternoon, and then we're drawn to something sweet, many of us, you know, and it is really then that we come to our state of neediness, which I think everyone experiences at different moments, where it would just be great to be taken care of, right? It would be great if your colleague walked in with a beautiful home baked cake and you share that moment together, but we live in the world in which we do. And so we have to make the best out of what we have. There's, there can be a sense of feeling orphaned. And by what I mean by that is that um, orals or people in the needy defense very often feel alone and they haven't quite found their tribe yet. You know, they feel they feel a little bit lost and lonely in this world, and um, and and disconnected. So, in that sense, um, it becomes all the more important that you make your home really, really cozy and really, really pleasant. Right, your inner home, but also the home in which you live. So, get a new painting, get a new rug you know buy some flowers it doesn't have to be expensive but really invest in your home so that you you feel at home more and more there can be a sense of anxiety um and there's a for 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 the needed offense there's a great question between giving and receiving right very often either people yeah very often people feel they want to 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 receive more than they're they're ready to give Okay, so how do we heal that? Um, so paradoxically or interestingly, despite the fact that for the oral, spending time alone is supremely threatening, uh, spending time alone is what really heals the oral defense. Time alone, you know, just go and travel for a weekend by yourself or go on a hike by yourself or just spend time alone. That's really, really nourishing um, if you are in that defense. You have to learn to nourish other people, so to nourish and care for others. So really switch out of this obsession that people have to take care of you and really learn that there's a bigger world out there and everyone needs to be nourished and cared for. Exercise, so you have to exercise. Um, exercise really engages you with this warrior energy that brings you out of this victimhood that's very often connected to orality and receive legitimate mothering from strong female healers. So to this, I want to say that I think we all need mothering, every one of us, men, women, old, young, we all need mothering because, because life is what it is and life is beautiful, but life is also tough, right? So find, find someone you resonate with, find a healer, a coach, uh, anything, you know, a therapist, anyone you resonate with, use your intuition for that and, and work with them receive healing touch, anything that works for you, foot reflexology, Thai massage, shiatsu, whatever works for you. But healing touch is so, is so profoundly nourishing, especially if you feel exhausted and like you've given too much or you're, you're feeling needy or whatever it is. So by the way, the exhausted giver and the controller, so the, the first two defenses that I spoke about, they're both secretly oral. So if you are an exhausted giver, there's orality. If you are a controller, there's hidden orality, right? Because behind those masks hides the need of wanting to be taken care of. Lifestyle recommendations. Lots of warmth. And so by that, I mean warmth in the house, warmth in the setting in which you work. Make it nice, make it cozy. Comfort, touch, what I just said, nourishing home, satisfying food, developing a sense that you have enough. Now, of course, around money, that's always a relative question, um, but just, just come to a place where you feel like you have enough. It's really cultivating a sense of abundance, also by practicing gratitude. Engage with practices where you're being listened to, that's so deeply um, healing. The mothering, that's what I said, especially if your relationship with your mother was conflictual, chances are high that you have a little bit more orality, right? Um, because how could you not? Because you didn't get sufficient of that mothering uh, as you grow up. Okay, and so when this, is, when this element becomes stronger, then there's a sense of stability, 
there's a stronger sense that you can take care of yourself and of others. You have a much better ability to set boundaries and there's a sense of trust and safety and you feel nourished by life, right? So that's something beautiful to strive for. So <clears throat> stop or reduce dairy or alcohol. Alcohol, by the way, in traditional Chinese medicine is mother's milk for adults. So what we do by drinking alcohol as adults is that we're trying to mother ourselves, right? We try to soothe ourselves. We try to, we try to engage the sense of connection um, that, that you might have felt. I mean, anyhow, you, 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 it's, it has to do with soothing and with relaxing, right, alcohol. So you need to be careful with it. Regular warm meals are super important. So really avoid raw food as well because um, your intestines really need that, that warmth and that warm support. Take time to chew well. Um, so just don't just like, you know, swallow down your sandwich on the go. Contact your intestines before you, you start your meal. If you have a sweet tooth, you can't, you can't just eclipse that. So have healthy sugars. So by that, I mean, for instance, rice and barley syrup, they are much less acidic than white sugar. You can bake with them, you can cook with them, you can even put white syrup into your coffee if you want to. And, um, and so that will really help also with the glucose levels in your body and um, prevent insulin resistance. And have naturally sweet occurring foods such as sweet potato, parsnips, pumpkins. The pumpkin season has just started, so lots of pumpkin soups and so on. Um, cooked onions, cooked local foods, that they will have help you to support your stomach and spleen and in you know and in that the the oral defense which means that the controllers and the masochists uh, will also be helped by engaging with these kind of um, uh, dietary recommendations and now we'll come to my last defense and then i will take questions um, the last defense is called the rigid defense or the false perfect now Rigids, you remember the controllers control others, right? The, rig the controllers are all about controlling the environment and, and their employees and maybe their family or whoever. Rigids don't do that. Rigids stay aloof and they stay distant, but they're very controlling with themselves, right? And they can be very tough on themselves as well. Rigids have a tendency um, to, 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 to be aloof, to be distant, and they communicate that they don't need anyone but themselves, right? Um, they have a tendency to reject. So if you're trying to get into a relationship or if you are in a relationship with a, with a rigid, then it's, it's sometimes difficult to reach their emotion and to feel closeness because they have this, um, this need for distance to feel safe. They, they abhor excess emotions uh, and they reject vulnerability. So if you put a rigid and an oral into the same room, that tends to get rather complicated because the oral is going to be very dramatic and very needy and will be rejected by the rigid, right? Because the rigid doesn't want to engage with this kind of um, behavior. The more successful a person is, the more they will rely on the rigid defense or the controlling defense. So the rigids and the controllers tend to be tend to be the leaders um, in our world. So we had Tom, Donald Trump as the controller. His wife Melania Melania Trump would be an ideal example of the rigid. So she's like a statue, right? And um, she doesn't portray. She doesn't give anything away of what she feels or what of what she thinks. And she projects this image of perfection around her in order to feel safe. <clears throat> so for the rigid image is everything. Um, as said, they present this perfect facade. So the clothes have to be impeccable. The house is, is impeccable. Um, the partner, the car, if it's a car, it's an expensive car. If, if they have a pet, then of course it's a petty gray pet. Uh, the house tends to be in, in a prime location. So everything has to be meticulous and, and has to portray this image of perfection towards the outside. Money is of paramount importance. Um, and so why do they do that? Let's not even judge it, right? Because there's something good behind it. So rigids generally have been humiliated in the past. 
they've been hurt, maybe they've been bullied in the childhood, maybe they've been bullied in the workplace uh, at some point. And through this pain, um, they, they at some point consciously or mostly unconsciously decided this shall never ever happen again. And so they build this armor, right? Because perfection, all this perfection is an armor that they can never again be humiliated or shamed again. They can be supremely proud. They can be highly competitive. Uh, they often need to feel better than others in order to feel safe. They hate neediness uh, and have a tendency to, re to refuse to need anyone. Um, Oh, yeah. And so this mask, when it becomes too extreme, because, because it's so much about rejecting the other and rejecting needs, the, the Bridgets really can't deal with the need of others and they can't actually deal with their own neediness, which every invariably they have, that can lead to loneliness. Um, so there can be a pronounced sense of loneliness behind all this perfection, but of course they will not show it. I'm sorry, Maria, if you could please mute everyone again, because I hear people talking in the background. Thank you. Okay, so they express their anger by withdrawing, carrying an affection towards other. Um, and uh, intimacy can feel dangerous to them. Uh, so it's very open to very difficult to open up and feel safe. They want to be pursued, chased, wanted and needed. Possible associated symptoms from a TCM perspective can be lung issues. So all this sadness and, and possibly even isolation uh, and distancing uh, and, 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 and yeah, sadness and loneliness in TCM is very often linked to the lungs. So there can be breathing issues, there can be asthma, uh, there can be skin issues. And in TCM, um, if you wake between three and five, that's also lung issues. So that can be, uh, that can be an associated symptom. So how to heal this? How to heal the rigid defense? Um, rigids really have to learn to trust others. They have to, they have to let their guard down. It's really difficult for rigids because they're so defended, right? So they really have to learn to, to let down that guard and allow other people in. So they have to learn to express their heart, to trust, uh, to step into their own vulnerability. They have to learn to share what they truly feel. Um, it might be very helpful to find a spiritual practice that opens the heart and to connect that connects them to something larger than themselves. So here, uh, healing groups can be really great. You know, just go to workshops like workshops where people, you know, where you feel really safe and where you learn to share about your inner world. That can be really a deeply nourishing practice. Again, getting a pet because pets are so non-threatening, right? Um, that really open the heart support the lungs and large intestine. I will get to that in a minute. Breath work, of course, physical exercise can help. So how to heal the lungs and how to heal um, the rigid defense. So what I'm sharing here is more about the lungs, right? Than, than the rigid defense bit, and how you, you, you can make sense of it. So to heal the lungs, and I'm also saying this in the present context, um, and the fact that we're in autumn approaching winter, and we need to keep our lungs and our immune system strong, avoid milk products. So really avoid cheese, yogurt, all this stuff, milk and so on, because there's a, because it really clogs up your respiratory um, uh, system, your lungs, your sinuses and your intestines. Milk, cheese, yogurt, all this cow's milk and so on really produces sticky mucus in your intestines. And that's the last thing you want right now. So avoid it, replace it with, you know, we have almond milk and we have um, oat milk and so on. And, and at least until March, I would abstain from milk products to really support the lungs. Um, eat lots of white vegetables. So in TCM, that is the recommendation to support your lungs. So things like cauliflower, daikon, radish, also a slightly pungent taste, onions, garlic, parsnips, celery roots. Have ginger tea daily throughout the winter. So you take a ginger root and you can take a, a Parmesan grate and just grate the ginger, hot water, and a little bit of rice syrup, for instance, or a little bit of honey. That really helps to take away the congestion from the lungs. And rigids also have to stop excess amount of sugar, processed food, and alcohol to which they're attracted in order not to feel so much what's going on for themselves, right? Okay. Now, the strengths, because 
I don't want anyone to leave from this talk thinking that one or the other defense is either wrong or faulty or that one defense is better than the other because they aren't. And we all use all of them in different moments of time. So the masochist, the exhausted giver, the beauty and the great gift that masochists and, and exhausted givers bring to the world is their loyalty and their huge generosity. Masochists know how to give and they know how to support and they need to be seen for that. So how, to, how do you heal masochism? You need to become more rigid. You have to go more towards the rigid defense. Rigids, <clears throat> for, 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 for all the complications they might bring, they have this wonderful talent at really, they're really good at setting boundaries. So rigidity, the rigid mask is such a beautiful antidote to masochism, to the exclusive giver. Rigids create order. Rigids are deeply connected to their self-worth and they create beauty, very often great sense of aesthetics. Um, and they know to ask for their worth and they wouldn't even engage if, they, if, if you wouldn't meet them in their self-worth, right? So for masochists, that's the antidote, rigidity. Go more towards the rigid. Now, the controllers, controllers, same thing. Controllers are hard working and they tend to be very confident at what they're doing. Um, and well, okay, sometimes, of course, when it gets too extreme, they're not competent and they just become destructive and dominant. But I'm not talking about that, right? I'm talking about healthy, healthy controllers, healthy controlling. But they're the same thing, you know, be careful with your boundaries and go towards the rigid um, so, that, so, that you can, so that you can impose boundaries um, on yourself. The escape artists, escape artists, despite the fact that they space out and that sometimes you can't really grasp them, when they incarnate more, when they feel more and more safe, they tend to be very inspirational messengers and teachers. They can be really great teachers. Um, and they often have yeah, important things to share with their surroundings. The needy or the oral defense is a bit like the masochist because behind the masochist is the oral defense, right? So, 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 so the, the orals really have to go, go towards rigidity because they have to step out of victimhood. They have to learn that they can take care of their needs autonomously. Um, and the great gift of the oral is that they're deeply, deeply loving. Orals are not afraid of giving their heart and they give it lovingly and, 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 and full of devotion. So that's something really beautiful from the oral defense. And last but not least, the rigid, which I've spoken just about. Well, guess what? <laughs> the rigid needs to become more oral <laughs> because the rigid is so distant from, 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 from allowing themselves to meet another that they have to go towards more orality, right? They have to learn to ask. They have to learn to be more expecting, more okay with showing their needs um, and, and sharing that with another. The beauty, I said, of the rigid is that they create order in this world, in the home, in society as a whole. They're really in touch with beauty. They create clarity and they have wonderful boundaries. So if boundaries are an issue, rigidity is your friend. <clears throat> so here, I just want to share this thing with you. We have different layers of consciousness and with this, I'm closing the presentation. So I just wanted to show you this, and this is also the way I work. So towards the outside, we project the persona, you know, maybe in the workplace we're one, maybe at home we're another. But below that, we have our beliefs. As we have seen, you know, each persona is constructed by a set of beliefs in order to feel safe, in order to, we think, get what we want, but we don't, right? We need to travel more deeply. So our, our beliefs are very often formed by fears and things that happen to us. Um, and, 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 and that in itself and builds the persona towards the outside. Under the fear, if we travel more deeply, there's very often lots of anger, a sense of injustice or something that might have happened to you. When we travel even deeper into ourselves, then we find a, a sense of sadness. And when we come through that, there comes a sense of truth and compassion. So that's the healing journey, right? The persona is just the outer defense, it's just the outer layer that we project towards the outer world. And the deeper we travel within ourselves, we come to a completely different level of truth and compassion and understanding for ourselves and for others. Leading to love, gratitude, and joy. <laughs>
Okay, so thank you for listening. That's the end of my presentation. I will now stop the screen share and go right. So that's it um, with regard Thanks. to the Thanks, I'm Henry Duran. Thanks you very much. It was really very, very interesting. Um, one of the colleagues asked you to maybe show again the slide of masochist. From the masochist? Masochist, yes, yeah. if, if it's possible. So I would like just to tell you that the presentation will not be sent, but you will uh, be able to uh, to review and replay the video that we are recorded. So it will be prepared and uh, we will send it to all participants once it's ready, okay? Because Iran doesn't want to send presentation uh, separately. Is it okay, Iran? Yeah, that's fine. So I'm, just, fine. I'm just going through the slides to show the, yes. the lucid giver. Yeah, I can, so one second, so here we are. So the, per nice. the person who made the request, is there something in particular you want? Oh, nice, some people are saying, okay, great. So uh, I'm just gonna share my screen again. And maybe Maria, maybe you can communicate in that time with the person in the chat. I'm happy to show the masochist again. So let me just uh, share. Yes, my... yes, of course, there is no, I'm, I'm just, great. there are a lot of uh, thank you, thank you. No, we don't have, if you, if you have any questions, you're welcome. Okay. And Irene is uh, uh, currently looking for this slide that one of our colleagues um, asked for. Yeah. So here we go. So here, so just based on the request, um, so here we have again the masochist, the exhausted giver. They give a lot. Uh, they have a tendency to overwork and exhaust themselves in the secret hope of being appreciated, seen and loved in the private realm, but maybe even in the, I mean, who doesn't want to be loved, right? So let's just not, let's just get to the core here. Um, okay, they had, tend to have a little sense of power. <laughs> so it is, it is so me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <Maria. laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, there's there's a sense of guilt, a sense of shame around needs, um, around around yeah, around projecting, becoming louder about themselves. Um, so I I just I'm I'm not I don't just don't want to read out the whole thing again. So I just hope that the person who asked the question um, can take from this what what is needed. Okay, I will stop the. I did it okay, so I will include you. Yeah, I'm there. I'm going to open the chat. Here we go. Okay, great. People, nice, brilliant. Okay, people are happy. Thank you. Question, please. Can the mass be mixed a bit of two and three? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, Irina. They can. Um, we, we shift, we shift, and, and how can I say this? You know, for example, for example, let's imagine you're controlled in the workplace, right? And you work hard and you're frustrated because you have to do all this stuff at work. And then you can suddenly like switch, let's say, to orality, you know, where you just you, you just you feel exhausted and you share to a colleague that you're empty, you're empty and you need support and you've just had it and you've just given everything you had. That's human nature, you know, I mean, that's I think I think if we're honest, we all have the five defenses within ourselves. You know, we all do. So, um, but we we shift, of course, and different different masks or different defenses dominate in different moments of time. So, um, I, I I can share a personal a personal anecdote. So I um I'm 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 really not schizoid at all. Like I'm 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 a super grounded person. But I had a phase in my life where things. Where, where things had happened right in my in my romantic life in my personal life and I I wasn't processing it you know like I wasn't understanding what I should understand and so I was developing this complete um yeah I just became a schizoid you know so I remember I was in a hotel in Austria I forgot my laptop there in the hotel in the drawer that would never happen to me normally I forgot my bank card you know in the bank thingy I was completely schizoid until I had to process, until I processed what I needed to process, you know? And once that was done, then I could ground again. And uh, yeah, just to come back to that, um, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm generally of very- course, you, Thank you, Ren, uh, for your explanation. Of course, we can, we can have different uh, attitude and behaviors uh, independently of the situation, 
the situation where, where in which we are. We are, for example, it depends also on the uh, the people with uh, to, with whom we are working. If you have a controller and you have this tendency tendency to be messagist or you know to be a giver, then uh, how it works? Okay, so so imagine you're an exhausted giver who works with an oral, right? Yeah, for example. Oh God, yeah. Um, chances are that you give and give and give, and at some point you blow up. <laughs> you just, you just, you know, because because the exhausted giver hasn't learned to to communicate their needs, or if they very often in orality they're not heard, right? So mm -hmm. of course that can be very difficult. But then you you need to talk about it, and both have to become very aware of what they're doing. So there has to be a very open communication about what's going on. Um, that you need to be honest and you need to, I think nonviolent com communication can really help there and you need to become very honest about what, very, of what both people are doing. I received a question here in the chat. Why is the oral called oral? Orality, you know, I mean, I think it's rather Freudian. I mean, uh, Wilhelm Reich was a scholar of, of Freud. And so it, I think it's about nourishment, right? Why, why is the oral called oral? Because the oral wants to be nourished by others, by the world and um, yeah. Voila. I'm, and the last, raised, yeah, someone the, someone raised their hand, but I'm just so someone is asking how long how long does the healing take? Mm, that is so personal. I mean, I mean, healing can take a long time. It depends what you want to heal, and it depends what your focus is. Uh, does it present a healing journey? The last slide. Does it represent the healing journey? Can you elaborate on the last slide? Okay. I I think. I think yes, I think that represents the healing journey. I think when we try to heal, we have we we are confronted by a situation that's not working for us, right? And in which we suffer. So that can be in the professional setting, in the personal setting, it can be a pattern that we're just not solving and from which we're suffering and from which perhaps we make other people suffer. And so in the healing journey, the first step is just to become very aware of what we're actually doing and what isn't working how we came to become this way and how we can change the pattern and for that and for that we need to travel inside so I think if I yeah that was your question yes that was for me that this is how the healing journey works we have to go we have to go to the places inside of ourselves um, that built us in this particular way okay so we have maybe we take Marietta raise raise your hands so yeah hey, Irene I wanted to say that based on your experience the one that you mentioned with the laptop that you forgot in Austria sometimes we need to have a shock in our life to understand that something needs to change and there is there is there isn't a single approach to make us understand that there are fields that need to be improved. For example, if someone tells me you're a controller or you're a masochist or you're in one of those five groups, I might not be able to change anything. But if something shocking happens to me, I might decide to take action. And maybe there's other people that uh, experience the same thing, feel the I'm same. I'm 100% with you, Marileta. I'm 100% with you. Crisis wakes us up, right? So it in does. Fact, so in general, how it happens is like, we have patterns and we repeat these patterns. Mm -hmm. right? Sometimes they work and then they don't work. Some patterns don't work. And then we keep on encountering that pattern and, and, and it might intensify. And then it becomes a crisis. It can be yeah. a crisis. It can be a different crisis. It can be a fight. It can be whatever. And then we have this shock and we realize, okay, I really, really, really have to change this. Yeah. You know, I cannot, you know, I mean, for me to leave my laptop in a drawer in a hotel in Austria, mm -hmm. this is outrageous. I never do this kind of stuff, you know? So as you said, yeah, that was a big wake up moment for me. It was. Fully agree. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. This is very, 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 very great exchange. Irene, um, there is a question. If you have, for example, how to face the, 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 the people, the controller or the, the rigid person, how can we uh, deal with these people to cope with them uh, daily? How, how do we cope with rigids or with, with controllers daily? To make them safe. Safer, maybe but the control to make himself safer. To make him. It, I, I, so, it, so, in the workplace, how do I deal with a control in the workplace? 
Yeah, workplace or even at your private way. I, I would say at, at the workplace. Yeah, okay. I, th I think um, it's difficult to get through, right? Um, so control is need to, it's just what, what uh, Mariletta said, you know, like it, it has to come, if it gets too extreme, it has to come to some kind of crisis, you know? But in the meantime, I, I, I think one has to point out the overbearing, if we talk about controllers, extreme controllers, you have to show them that their overbearing behavior is of use to no one. In fact, it's counterproductive and everyone suffers in that setting. There's the, if, if it comes from sheer dominance and the sheer need to control and dominate, everyone involved suffers. And once they become aware of the extent of damage that they cause in the setting, um, I think then something might change. I mean, of course, you know, we have psychopathy and so on, and we have people who don't want to learn to listen and voila. So the, the path of introspection is, is, is not given for everyone, you know, like many, I, th I think only when we, only when we really suffer or we have really suffered or we have made another suffer do we decide that we want to change you know we say this is enough now i've had enough of myself i've had enough of my pattern i need to change this because i don't want to suffer this anymore and i don't want to make the people around us suffering and <clears throat> there's this beautiful saying in english you can only lead the horse to the water but you can't make it drink right you can only point things out to others it's up for them to to wake up to the calling I, I hear I hear some background noise again. If you can, uh, I can't do it. To mute. Okay, so let's have a look. Uh, Maria, can you can you mute people, please? Super, thanks. Yes, I'm I'm, no, no. I'm I'm doing, but you know, it's sometimes the people open the, and mute at themselves. Okay, so so other questions here. Great presentations. How could we behave if people have different masks? For example, what's the best way to face the controller or the needy? So, Stefania, I hope I just answered to the controller the needed offense. Yeah. With, with, with orals, with orals, the best defense um, is to ask open questions. It really works. You know, so you so so orals generally they will sit down and start complaining, right? and 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 ask for support and so on and so you just bombard them with open questions what have you done to improve your situation you know what steps have you already taken to improve to 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 change your situation for the better and you can say to them i have the fullest trust in you that you will find a solution to your problem you have to you need to become with orals you have to become super rigid so you have, when you're, when you're faced by an oral, and of course there are different states of orality, right? Your best friend, you know, might be super sad and need you and call you up in the evening and she or he is oral in that moment because there, something happened in their life and they want you support and they need you to listen to them. So that's perfectly legitimate orality. Yeah, let's not make, make it bad. But there are people who get stuck in orality and make it an identity. That is very challenging for their surroundings. You need to become rigid, totally rigid, really like develop a rigid armor and show them that you're not going to, you don't let them get away with it. You know, <clears throat> you sit in your center, you sit in your strength and you just say to them, listen, I, I really, I trust you to do it. I know you're going to find the solutions. Um, and, and, and what have you already tried and why hasn't that worked? And what else have you tried in order to make it work? You make it about them. You keep on making it about them, and then you leave because, yeah, it might be too energy vogue, as they say in French. Okay, so there's a question. I wonder if we can make a link with the five wounds from Lise Bourbeau. I'm really sorry, I don't know Lise Bourbeau, but I'm happy to look into it after this conversation, after this talk. How do we heal the kidney and the liver, the exhausted giver? Um, okay, I. I so the kidneys, lots of rest, lots of rest and warm food um, and time out and really like lots of sleeping and um, slowing down. And the liver, lots of leafy green vegetables, non-competitive sports and expressing your deeper truth in a nutshell. Okay, 
Peter is asking, does one need to heal if you're a giver or masochist? You do a lot of good things and help others when they need. This is such a good thing, isn't it? It can't become too much though. Exactly. I mean, you've just said it, Peter. It can't become too much. Of course we should give. Of course we should be generous to others. You know, it's a beautiful thing. But the question is always, is there a balance for you between giving and receiving? And have you learned to receive? And are you filling up enough? Are you receiving enough, right? At the end of the day, or do you feel empty? Do you give from a place of fullness or do you give from a place of emptiness is the question. What if the pattern is truly protecting you and letting the defense down makes it worse than where you started? Mm, okay, so Rosalinda, if you, and I, I'd like to hear more about that. It's a little bit difficult to, um, so of course, if you're, if you're if you're together with an oral let's just take that example and you've been in masochism of course rigidity then will protect you and you need the rigidity to keep your boundaries right so then you shouldn't let go of rigidity until your partner has taken care of their orality for example you know so um if you can you can juggle and really use these um these different defenses for your own good my girlfriend does tell me to focus more on me and say no more often. Okay, Peter. So Peter, you yeah, okay, this yeah, okay, right. There you go. So you, you this is the consultation, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. How do you engage a schizoid who keeps spacing out? Tatiana, it's I think I think I mentioned it in the talk. Um you slow down. You have you have to slow down the energy. You slow down. If the energy is super hectic and, and super rapid, you need to slow down, make everything slower. You, you have to create a mellow uh, atmosphere if it's at home, also in the workplace. Maybe it's a, if it's at home, you put candles, you, you create. You have to watch your own stress levels. Maybe you're, you're, you're stressing the other person out. I don't know. You have to slow down. You have to make them feel safe. You slow down in the mode of conversation. You make them become aware that they have left their body. And you ask them, for instance, to place both feet on the floor, and to come back, to come back to the present moment and not be afraid. Okay. Thank you. So right. we have so many, we had so many questions, but we can't, of course, answer to all of them. But mostly you have answered, Iren. I am very uh, happy uh, that you could um, make it because it's uh, already 6 p.m. People are 6 p.m. So we are still uh, many, many. We are we have, we are still 140. Mm -hmm. I would like really to to thank you, all colleagues, for your your um, present um, your fidelity. Your, I will say uh, the trust because you are always follow us since we have started this kind of uh, uh, workshop and uh, conferences, and it. This is the, the end of the second cycle. So now is the last one. Um, a big, big thank you to Iran, to all of you. And maybe we will see again in the different circumstances. It was my last session with you as well. I would like really to wish you the, warmly the very good um, continuation if the different situation in the workplace and the workplace because we are facing the different changing we have to adapt we have to accept the new place the new work way of working but we as a r d we will support you as as much as we can so be happy and stay in touch thank you very much bye bye thank you maria <laughs>